The following program is sponsored by friends and partners of Kingdom Connection. With everything going on in the news today, it's easy to see why so many people live in fear and depression. But that's not God's plan for your life. And today on Kingdom Connection, my dad continues to teach from his brand new book, The Spirit of Python. He's teaching us today on defeating tormenting spirits. If you or someone you know has been dealing with the spirit of heaviness or listening to deceiving spirits that want to tear us apart, this message is for you. God has given us every tool to defeat the plans of the enemy. I'll be back in a moment to let you know more about this message and other resources. But right now, let's join my dad, Pastor Franklin, at Free Chapel in Gainesville, Georgia, for today's message. I think we need to understand that we're, we're fighting spiritual battles. I'm not a demon chaser. I'm not somebody who is one to overemphasize the power of Satan and all of that. But if we're not careful, the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 6, and put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the attacks of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness and heavenly uh, wickedness in heavenly places. Notice he said we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But I think most Christians have taken the comma and moved it from where it says flesh and blood and they've moved it up to for we do not wrestle. And they put a period. Because we don't, we don't even hardly acknowledge there is a devil in the church anymore. We, we don't wrestle with the enemy. If you're not praying, you're not wrestling. If you're not f taking the Word of God, you're not wrestling. If you're not praying in the Spirit, you're not wrestling. If you're not a praiser and a worshiper, you're not wrestling with the powers of darkness. They do not fight flesh, with the flesh things. Our weapons are not carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. There are tormenting spirits, vexing spirits, the Bible calls them. This is a biblical name. They torment people's minds. They torment through depression, through worry, through excessive Fear, just tormenting, this is going to happen. And yeah, you succeeded, but you're going to lose everything. You're, you're going to be homeless. You're going to be sick. You're going to die. They torment people's mind, vexing spirit. The Bible talks about there was a woman who was vexed with the spirit. The enemy whispers suggestions, just give up. Just, just, just kill yourself. Just end your life. Vexing spirits have to do with tormenting the mind. They attack through shame, through condemnation, through worry, through fear, through depression. Isaiah 61 and 3 said, when you are faced with a vexing spirit that's trying to oppress your mind, trying to keep you down, trying to keep you grieving and discouraged and hopeless and trying to keep you in that, in that negative, dark place of, uh, uh, of worry and anxiety, he said, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Put on the garment of praise. When a vexing spirit tries to torment you, he said, you are to put on the garment of praise that, that fights against thoughts of despair, thoughts of hopelessness, thoughts of fear. Resist them. And as you, as you humble yourself and you begin to put on praise, what does that mean? That means that you, you put on a CD and begin to worship instead of listening to the, to the taunting voice of the serpent that's telling you you're going to die and nothing good and something is bad is going to happen. That is not the voice of God. 
God's voice is never telling you, be dreadful, be worried, be fearful, be tormented. Never will the Holy Spirit give you a thought that tells you to do that. And when you hear these thoughts, put on the garment of praise for the spirit that's trying to make life heavy. Put it on. I tell people in the book to speak a praise phrase. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Glory to God. I love you, Lord. I know that you are for me. Hallelujah. Praise your name. Jesus, you're good. The favor of God is on me. God, I praise you that no weapon formed against me will prosper. This is how we win. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit that tries to weigh you down. Get a praise phrase. That's how you defeat tormenting spirits of the mind. Never speak words that make the enemy think he's winning. One of the greatest weapons God has given you is your mouth. The Bible said in Psalms 149, with the, with the high praises of God in their mouth and the sword in their hand, they bind kings and princes. We bind principalities and powers when we take the Word of God in our hand like a sword and we take the high praises of God in our mouth. Deceiving spirits are another form of the demonic world. Deceiving spirits. Spirits that are deceiving people. There's vexing spirits that torment the mind. Heaviness comes on people. Discouragement, hopelessness, down, depressed. And the remedy for that is praise phrase, speaking the praise. Read the book of Psalms. Put on the garment of praise. And then there's deceiving spirits. The Bible said that in 1 Timothy 4 and 1, the Spirit expressively says in the latter times many will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Anytime you open yourself up to doctrines of demons and false teachings, you are, you are playing with the powers of Satan. Don't care how many Hollywood hot shots come out and say Scientology is cool, or Islam is cool, or, or, or Kabbalah is great, and this religion and that religion, New Age, this and that, leave it alone. There are deceiving spirits. Well, it's not all bad, you see, you know, you can pick up things. When you open the door to Satan's plan through horoscopes, fortune tellers, palm readers, psychics, you don't need a psychic to tell you what your future is going to be. The devil can't tell you what the future is going to be for your life. All he can do is plant his thoughts in your mind and your life will begin to move in the direction. Have you ever had somebody say to you, you feel okay, you don't look good. All of a sudden, well, the enemy is the great mind manipulator. He loves to suggest this is going to happen and that's going to happen. I don't need a Chinese fortune cookie to tell me what my future holds. I know what my future holds. Whatever comes, I'm in his hands. I, I'm safe. I'm secure. Everything's going to be all right. And even when I die, I'm in his hands. Deceiving spirits, seances, talking with the dead, communicating with the dead. King Saul lost his kingdom because he went to the witch of Endor. Stay away from that stuff. Stay away from the occult. Stay away from that uh, dark side stuff. Just stay away from, you know, it's just games. It's just, we, we, we went to a party. First of all, what are you doing at that kind of party? I, I, I'm a little disturbed because I keep hearing people say, I'm saved and I'm Holy Spirit filled. Uh, people even making comments like, I'm saved and filled with the, filled with the Spirit. You know, I, I, I left my wife and I'm living with a girl now, but I'm still saved and, and God still loves me and I'm filled with the Spirit. Do you want me to tell you what kind of Spirit you're filled with? I can do that. 
You're, spill, you're filled with the spirit of adultery. You're, you're filled with the spirit of immorality. You're, you're, you're filled with an unclean spirit. But you're not filled with the Holy Spirit because you only get full of what you yield. Your inf- you, have to, you have to yield to the Holy Spirit, for, and then he will influence you. If you le- yield to lust, then you know what's going to happen? Lust is going to get greater. But if you yield to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to get greater. But you have to choose. But you can't have the Holy Spirit and live that kind of life. He will vacate the premises. They're territorial spirits. Higher level territorial principalities. Las Vegas, gambling. Los Angeles, entertainment, New York, finance, Washington, D.C., politics, power. The remedy to these stronghold principalities is the local church. The only thing that can defeat those kinds of principalities is the community of believers praying and fasting Churches like this and many others across the nation that God raises up and the people begin to pray and the people begin to fast and the people begin to push on the climate and push on the principalities and push on the powers until finally there comes a breakthrough. we got to get back to praying. This is one thing I really feel in my spirit. Prayer is the opportunity incubator. And if you're not getting any opportunities in life, it's because you're not praying enough. Because if you will pray, prayer is an opportunity incubator. The enemy doesn't want us to pray as a church. He wants us to come to church, do church, and leave, and leave prayer out of our life, leave the Word of God out of our life. He said in Ephesians 3 that the manifold wisdom of God would be taught to principalities and powers, listen to this verse, by the church. Churches like this are territorial churches. And we are to pray and we are to fast and we are to teach the Word of God and we are to live the Word of God and we are to bind and we are to loose and we are to stand and we are to fight for our communities. We are to fight for our schools. We are to fight for our families. We are to fight for our children and our marriages. And as we stand, the more we get together, one can chase a thousand, two, ten thousand. That's why hell hates churches like this, especially churches that are teaching stuff like I'm teaching right now because we're not just here when it's not just one person praising God but it's thousands of people praising God piercing the darkness driving back the power of the enemy if we really get a revelation of who we are we teach the principalities and powers the manifold wisdom of God according to Ephesians 3 by the church he said this would happen What do you need to know about demon possession? Oh, my God. You believe in demon possession? Well, Hollywood does. I just wish somebody in the church would. Hollywood's making a lot of money off of it. Yes, I do believe in demon possession. I have five times, five times. First of all, there should be extreme caution when dealing with this subject because there are people who are who are sensational and do stupid things and it it does not bring glory to Jesus Christ. But five times in the time I've been called to preach through the years, I've dealt with real demon possession and had to, uh, to expel demon powers from people's lives five times. But I thought about as I was getting this book together, what are the signs that someone is potentially demon-possessed. How, how do you know? One of the first signs that a person is demon-possessed is they, the, the demons are able to energize people with incredible strength. In the case of uh, Mark chapter 5, the Bible said that they could not restrain the man. Chains were put on him, and the chains could not hold him. No one could subdue the man. I've seen a few people in this shape. It's not an everyday occurrence, but there are people 
who become demon-possessed, and they are given supernatural strength from that demonic power. Another sign that someone is demon-possessed is uncontrolled cursing. Almost every time that I have encountered someone demon-possessed, they will blaspheme the name of God over and over and over. And when you begin to pray for them, it's not unusual for them to explode in profanities about God and His name and cursing God. I'm not saying that every person who curses, that, 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 that's not a demon, that's your temper. <laughs> but, but certainly, almost always, an uncontrolled compulsion to blaspheme God's name. When someone is demon-possessed, it's not unusual for contortions in the facial features. Their countenance of their eyes become glazed. I've seen it and recognized it. It's almost like you're looking. It is. It's just like you're looking into the eyes of, of something else other than that person. I've seen people's faces and just contort and change. I could tell you stories that some of you wouldn't believe, but it is what it is, and it's very real. They look different. A countenance comes over them. Their eyes many times will become darkened almost, and... Um, the, the voice will many times go to a lower pitch or sound. Changes come immediately. The personality of the person changes. You can see a total change in their demeanor. Many times, if someone is demon-possessed, listen carefully to what I'm saying, those demons will bring deep depression, despondency, and even suicidal tendencies. It can be a sign of a demonic attack. These conditions can go beyond spiritual torment to a person trying desperately to harm themselves and even kill themselves. The demonic of Gadaria had a self-destructive spirit. He would take stones and cut himself with those stones. And when I see young people, young girls who starve themselves with anorexia and cut themselves as... And, and hide those scars all over their legs because something is gnawing at them internally, it is, it is a sign that there is an evil spirit at the very least oppressing that person. And it needs to be dealt with spiritually. Get them help if a doctor can help them. But I'm going to tell you, there is, there, there is no remedy if it is the power of Satan other than the blood of Jesus Christ and the name that is above all names. <laughs> Extreme caution should be used when discerning whether someone is demon-possessed or not. Don't, don't ever do that. If you, if you suspect that, then get an elder. Get someone who is very mature and experienced in spiritual things and, let, and has the gift of discernment and let them, because sometimes we've all seen well-meaning Christians just, you know, grab a, uh, somebody and, and just, listen, I don't allow the devil to take over my church services. If somebody's going to manifest, they're not going to do it in here. We'll drag them back there and cast them out. I'm not going to give the, the, the devil prime time. He doesn't deserve it. You know, I love Jesus the way. Are y'all getting anything out of this? I'm, I'm just, I, I love the way Jesus, Jesus didn't think very much of the devil. You remember that time when they brought the, they brought the boy that was possessed with the devil to Jesus? You know, the disciples tried to cast him out and they couldn't. And Jesus is standing there and they brought the guy that's possessed with the devil. It's almost funny. And the Bible said the, 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 boy, uh, the boy started foaming at the mouth and fell to the ground and began to waller on the ground. The word wallow in Greek is waller. <laughs> and, and flop. Can you see him? He's eh. And the Bible said he was growling and foaming at the mouth and wallowing on the ground. <laughs> because they always resist. They always resist. And, and he was foaming at the mouth. And it's almost like I could almost see Jesus with a knife and an, and an apple. And he's, he's, he, and he said, how, how long has he been like this? He really didn't respect the devil very much. And they said, he's been like this since, since a child. And Jesus said, shut up. 
don't say anything else to the demon and cast them out instantly. That's our Jesus. My, my brother and I were preaching a revival in North Carolina many years ago. And one Sunday morning during that revival, my brother and I got up and started singing the hymn when he reached down his hand for me. He had to we reach way down for me. And I'm telling you, it was like the presence of God filled that church. People began to weep and cry. The altars, without us asking while we were singing the presence of God. And there were, there were it was packed because the revival had been going. And uh, people began to stream to the altars. Teenagers, young people, moms, dads, weeping, crying. Just beautiful, powerful, moving service. And uh, while all that was going on, a, and the service was kind of dying down, the pastor was back up, my brother and I were over to the side just praying with people, and the people were still singing. And a man, well-dressed man in a nice-looking suit, came up to me and my brother and said, Can I talk to you privately? We, we, we went to a little side place. and When we walked in there, his countenance began to change. We felt an eerie presence. I'll never forget it. This was the first time I ever encountered what I'm preaching about. As soon as we walked into that place and, and looked at this man, there was an eerie presence of evil. And what I had only read about and heard about in doctrine, suddenly I was keenly aware you're facing someone that is demon-possessed. I laid my hand on the man's shoulder as my brother did, and we began to pray for him. And as soon as we did, everything I just mentioned, his eyes, his countenance, his voice, I mean dressed in a nice suit, a leader in the community, he began this growling and moaning and and um, I'll never forget when we, when we laid our hands on him and began to pray. And I, to be honest, somebody said, well, you know, I'm sure, Pastor, you, you felt great faith. I felt terrified. And the demon began to say, we will not leave growling. We will not leave. He took the man's voice. We will not leave. We hate you. And then they said, leave us alone. We will not leave. I hate you. Leave us alone. And I thought, if you won't leave, I will. Richie, God bless you. <laughs> I started to get out of there. I'm just telling you the truth. I remember it like it was yesterday. But something came up in me. The Bible said when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up. Something in me said... You know, we hear that scripture, greater is he that is in you than he is. But when in moments like that, there is a rush of the Holy Spirit that comes that says don't back down one bit. There is a name that is greater than what you're looking at. And then something beautiful happened when, when all of that was over. This went on for maybe 10, 15 minutes, the whole thing in about 20 minutes, everything. The guy, suddenly his countenance changed. You could feel a lightness and a freedom in the atmosphere. He began weeping, sobbing, crying. I said, pray this prayer. And Richie and I led him to Jesus. He wept and confessed Jesus as his Lord. He later went on to tell us that he had been bound with pornography and was in an adulterous affair with one of the women in the church. I'm not saying every person who looks at pornography and is in adultery is demon-possessed, but certainly there are demonic powers that are working behind those things. And I'll never forget walking out of that room, knowing that man had changed, knowing and seeing firsthand there's power in the name of Jesus. Did you hear what I just said? And I want to close with this. 
I wrote something down and I, I put it in the book and I believe it to be the truth. Satan is the prince, the power of the air. But there's something that can cancel the devil's assignment off of our lives more than anything else. And it is the blood of Jesus Christ. Listen to this. The greatest fear of demons is the blood of Jesus Christ. The application of the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the cross provides protection and against the power of Satan and defeat from demon powers. We overcome Revelation 12 by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The devil cannot cross the bloodline. The heart that has been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ is holy ground and the devil dares not try to enter it. And I want us to begin to understand that the enemy is very real. Some of you have been tormented in your minds. Some of you have been listening to deceiving spirits. Some of you may know someone who is so bound and so addicted that there is the possibility of demon possession or even demon oppression that is very real. Did you know that you as a believer have the power and the authority, especially after hearing a message like this, your faith goes up to address that evil spirit and say, you will not have my friend, my cousin, my dad, my mom, alcoholism, drug addiction, immorality. You will not have my family. I plead the blood of Jesus. You're using the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony, and it defeats Satan through the name of Jesus. Can we just lift our hands a moment and just worship God all over this room? Because there's power in His name and in His blood. Come on, just right now, I want you to be free. I want everybody in this room to be free. I want everybody in this room to be free from demonic influence, demonic oppression, secret habits, and all kinds of stuff that Satan is, may not be possessing people with, but he is oppressing many lives. Come on, let's worship in this room just a moment. Let's just believe that the power of the blood of Jesus can cleanse and set free. I claim freedom. You shall know the the truth, John 8, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Are you ready for a breakthrough? Call the number on your screen and let one of our prayer partners know how we can pray for you. We are here to help build your faith and stand with you to defeat the plans of the enemy. Today's message and so much more are in my dad's brand new book, The Spirit of Python. To get yours, call or go online now and take advantage of this special offer. And be sure to utilize all the resource that we've created online to help build your faith. Your support allows us to take the gospel all around the world, including messages like you just heard. So thank you for watching and we'll see you next time right here on Kingdom Connection. This program has been brought to you by the friends and partners of Jensen Franklin Media Ministries. For more information on this broadcast or for additional resources, go online at jensenfranklin.org.